for food insecure students. I'm Lisa Oligas and this is Newsmakers. There are more than 7,500 students in Joplin schools and more than 60% of them live in poverty. In this edition, we look at all the efforts of the Bright Futures Joplin program and a new campaign called the Milk Money Drive. We begin our discussion with Bright Futures Joplin Executive Director, Amanda Stone. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start with a little bit of a history though, if we, if we can. Bright Futures began back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And what was its initial mission when we really wanted to get it all started? Graduation rates. It was started in the beginning to help our students get to graduation, to help them. Uh, we would remove any barriers to their success to help them get there. And so part of that is food. Mm -hmm. Let's has the Snack Pack program been part of it all along? I believe it has. I believe it has. It's um, before me, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think 2015-ish It's is when it started, so maybe not since the very beginning, but pretty close. How, let's talk about the importance of nutrition to learning. I mean, you don't want kids to go to school hungry, right? Sure. I mean, if you don't have enough nutrition on the weekend while you're away from school, then I don't see how they would be expected to come to school on Monday prepared to learn and grow and focus. I mean, it's just not its not how our bodies work. Well, and Maslow's hierarchy of needs came out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's based on those physiological needs, such mm -hmm. as food, shelter, feeling safe, yes. um, you know, and sleep even mm -hmm. before you can concentrate. So yes. food is obviously critical. You guys do serve breakfast in schools, mm -hmm. but for some kids being in school, that might be their, their main source of meals and nutrition, uh, correct? Definitely. For these food insecure students that get snack packs, they meaning food insecure there, meaning that they're not having enough food when they're away from the stability of school breakfast and lunch. Okay, so you've seen the need for the snack packs grow. Tell us about that when it was in its early days and, and how many are we mm -hmm. making each week? Right now we're at 619, that is a very high number. Uh, two years ago we were about 385 and it just has steadily increased. And that is every yes. week? Yes. So give us an idea of what goes into the snack pack bag. Uh, it's as much nutrition as we can pack in there um, while being shelf stable and the foods the kids will still eat. So whole grain cereal bars, cereals, uh, popcorn, fresh fruit, applesauce, uh, shelf stable milk, uh, granola bars, trail mix, uh, crackers, yeah. All kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned cereal and you do want milk for cereal and you know milk is something that a lot of families may say hey that's a little pricey so mm -hmm. you're saying shelf stable milk and that's kind of the source of the reason for this milk money drive. Tell yeah. us about this new campaign. Yeah well with the high snack pack numbers uh, this buying shelf stable milk at about 60 cents per carton. Uh, two cartons go in each snack pack every week for each student. So the money is just it's it's much higher than we ever anticipated. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we need some help. So what would the, the cost expectation be? I mean, if you had to just buy them outright? If uh, we do, buy, do buy them, them we right do now. buy them. Um, with, uh, we're a, a, a nonprofit organization, 501c3. So all the funds we get are donations or grants. And so we will spend close to $25,000 this school year on just milk. Milk alone. Yes. So it really does take some donations to make that difference. Yes. Um, how does, providing the milk impact your entire back snack pack budget? I mean, mm -hmm. does it make it harder to then get other items? The milk is, is a good one third of our entire budget. So, and, and we feel like it's important to include, if we're gonna include cereal and peanut butter and uh, milk is a big part of the nutrition there. Yeah, and how can people donate to the Milk Money mm -hmm. Project? Uh, we, they can go to brightfuturesjoplin.org uh, and donate, there's a donate button there for um, specifically for the Milk Money Drive. There's also, um, they can do through, so on Facebook with Bright Futures Joplin, or they can bring a donation to 825 South Pearl, um, which is the Memorial Education Center for Joplin Schools and where the Bright Futures Donation Center is located. So you also do take donations of food mm -hmm. and that's certainly always welcome, but sure. in order to get that milk in there, it's probably gonna take some financial donations. Yeah, the milk, um, it's pricey and it's not something that's readily available like you can find it and buy it but we buy it in such bulk that we do get a discounted price mm -hmm. um so we do we we're just looking for funds to help us purchase that milk yeah and as far as food donation donations we love uh, donations for our snack pack program but we do have a specific menu and that's on our website um but yeah it's generally shelf stable items like granola bars and such for sure mm -hmm. so how many volunteers does it take to get these snack pack bags already every week every week we're looking for oh 
eight people, eight to 10 people, too many is too crowded and not enough makes it go really slowly. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Extra hands yes. always helps. Yes. And we caught up with the snack packing crew in action. As we go to break, we talked to one of those volunteers about the effort. Local volunteers fill hundreds of plastic bags with Cheez-Its, apples, and milk. They are called snack packs, and volunteers are hoping they can change children's lives. Gail Stratton is one of the Bright Futures volunteers and is glad to share why she donates her time. To help the children with their food, and I didn't have money to do it. And so I called the foundation and they said, well, we need people to pack, and so here I am. Gail believes what they're doing will have an impact. So, so many hundreds of children in Joplin who go hungry every day. Gail gives us an inside view of the packing process and explains why it's important for snack packs to include milk. Bones, growing children with bones, yes, they need that and good teeth. They work as teams even competing to see who can bag snacks the fastest. We've done over 700 in the past. The number has risen steadily throughout the school year. So uh, last week it was 606, this week it's 609. So it just depends if, if kids move into the school district or if they change schools or if their circumstances change and, um, and, they, and they need weekend food, then it's just a constantly moving target. What doesn't change is the impact made by volunteers whether the time commitment is big or small. I've been doing this for years and years, and um, it's just, it's heartwarming to see so many other people volunteering to help. For Newsmakers, I'm Sadie Heisner. Being a lion comes with a reputation for excellence. Whether it's in the classroom, on the court, or in the community. Lions are leading the way with innovative and immersive academic programs, new scholarship opportunities, and a campus committed to the future. Now is the perfect time to find your purpose. Find your pride at Missouri Southern State University. Hello from the studios of KGCS TV. I'm Lydia Carlson, a communications major here at Missouri Southern. We're making lots of changes to modernize the TV station and bring you better quality video and content. But we need your help. We want to find out how you watch KGCS and what you like to watch. So we'd like you to take a quick questionnaire. It's as simple as holding your phone over the QR code on your screen. That code takes you to a link where you will see a short survey. If QR codes aren't for you, find a link to the survey on our Facebook page. Thanks for watching KGCS TV. back to Newsmakers, where we are talking about Bright Futures Joplin. There's a new call for milk with the Milk Money Drive, but it is an organization that exists through donations of all kinds, financial, food, and manpower through volunteers. We just saw that with the packing of the snack packs. Joining us to talk about the donation center is Darla Armstrong, a retired teacher now working part-time with the Bright Futures program, and Amanda Stone, the coordinator, returns with us. Darla, thank you for joining You're us, welcome. Darla. You, you've been involved for a really, really long time. So tell us what initially got you involved with Bright Futures. Well, the very beginning was the tornado. And um, the evening after the tornado, a group of administrators and teachers met at North Middle School. And we started tracking down students and employees 
and it just never stopped from there. We used North Middle School as a location for donations most of the summer, and donations just came in. We just, we were overwhelmed and so blessed to get so mm -hmm. many things. I mean, it was a warehouse, big warehouse at that time. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, and at that point we moved out to MoDOT, and um, there was a huge room downstairs at MoDOT, and um, they had asked me to be involved with that, and then with retirement hours, I couldn't really do what Amanda was doing, so I started with the donation center, and they're like, Darla, would you like to get this organized? And I'm like, well, sure, I don't mind. And so we walked in there in this huge room with a pile of clothes to the ceiling, <laughs> nothing else. That's, that's what we walked into. So John Cody, who was a building engineer at the time, he helped me and we gathered some shelves and put shelves together. And I started working on processes and procedures. How were we going to get, find out what the students needed and what was the best way to get those things to them and make the kids feel, not feel like they're being singled out. And mm -hmm. so that was part of the processes that we worked on. And um, eventually we started with, we had a lot of help. It wasn't a one person thing to do. And um, we had some AmeriCorps kids come in and help. Yeah. And um, I even did a semester of AmeriCorps and I felt like my time could be better used not filling out the paperwork, which is important, but I wanted to keep helping kids like right away, right, right. away. Um, and we didn't have the students come to um, the building, to administration building. It was always taken to the kids to, um, at that time we didn't necessarily use um, the counselors as our go-to, it was the teachers and the principals. Mm -hmm. But now they basically go through the counselors, don't mm -hmm. they? For the most part. And, and how do you think that process helps? Like you said, you didn't want to single kids out. Mm -hmm. How have you made that work so that they're getting what they need without it being maybe embarrassing on their part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and as they get older, shame starts to come in there as, as a mm -hmm. factor. And we just trust that the counselors handle it appropriately um, and get them what they need with discretion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've worked with children because you were a teacher. Marla, uh, Darla, how did you, when you saw kids in need, how did you know? I mean, and, and why was it important to you when you saw kids that we met those needs? Well. One reason that I felt like I had a little bit of a leg up on some teachers that aren't out and about, mm -hmm. I always did a breakfast duty and some of the teachers thought I'd lost my mind, but I would see the kids first thing in the morning and if they were having a problem, I could just zoom in on it, try to turn them around, change their day, and then they didn't spend a whole day getting in trouble or you know, they missed their breakfast or whatever was going on. Hopefully, I was able to make a little bit of a difference that way. Are, did you notice that there are a lot of kids who were dependent? Same kids being at breakfast all the time? Uh, yes, yes, pretty much. I mean, once in a while, you'd have a child that didn't typically need that, but then that was always a good time to, to be able to catch a student that could have fallen through the cracks, you know, and mm -hmm. had a miserable day. But if one person could see that they were having a rough start to their day, they could turn them around. Yeah. So. Did you feel like as an instructor that you saw a difference in the kids after the Bright Futures program was implemented? I had retired in 10, mm -hmm. so mine was more of an administrative side. Yeah. So I didn't get to see that piece. I got to be behind the scenes and fill the requests and, you know, just hope that it did change their day or made. What kind of feedback did you get from teachers once kids start getting those items or you know, taking home the snack packs. They're grateful and they're thankful because um, before Bright Features, it's the teachers that were doing it. And so they're, they're very grateful that we're able to help them um, and that their kids that they care so much about are getting the help that they need. Do you feel like, I mean, part of the, like you said, the goal was to get them to graduation. Are we seeing an impact in the classroom? Um, I, I don't know. That one is a, yeah, that one's a yeah. teacher question. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yes, I would say yes, I'm sure. Okay, so we've talked about food, but there are other donations. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, especially at wintertime, you always worry about a kid who comes to school without a coat. What are mm -hmm. some of the other things that you set up at the donation center that you well, had? Well, Amanda has done an awesome job. They're, she's even doing bicycles to help some of the mm -hmm. high school kids for transportation. So, you know, in the winter, you don't want them on a bike if bad weather, but mm -hmm. um, 
would send out bicycles, and she doesn't just do the bicycle, she'll do the helmet and the chain, mm -hmm. and that's, then the kiddos will have to be responsible for the safety piece of it, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have a lock to lock their bike up, and they can get where they need to be, yeah. get to class. Yeah, the bikes are a big part of the flex program. So for our high school students that have to work and go to school, if they don't have transportation, then they're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to graduate. Um, so yeah, that's a piece that that's that we really think yeah. is important. Talk about, I mean, clothing, is that still mm -hmm. an issue for kids? Yeah. Huge, yeah, that's a huge part of what we do. Um, anything that's a barrier to their success. So a lot of that's basic needs, clothing, shoes, weather appropriate clothing. So coats, um, gloves, hats, um, anything, anything that, that could be a barrier to them coming to school and being successful yeah. with their peers. Hygiene. I mean, hygiene. Had any feel, hygiene. Feel, feel, uh, hygiene requests just the other day. Yeah. We weren't doing that much in the beginning of hygiene. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, we had, out at MoDOT, we were lucky enough, we were able to share some things that we got that we would have shelves of laundry soap mm -hmm. and things like that that we didn't need at that time. So during the tornado, there were other groups that we were able to share what we didn't need. Mm -hmm. I mean, I interviewed a high schooler once who was in, in a poverty situation, and she said, you know, she didn't have the feminine hygiene mm -hmm. items she needed, and she said that makes it horrible to try and go to school Absolutely. or even be at home. So, and then even cleaning, like, you know, shampoos, mm -hmm. are, are those things that you get to the students and their families? Definitely, yes, anything, really anything. We can work with our community and with our resources to get them what they need. Um, because they can't, if they need to shower, if they need towels or anything, kids, foster kids or kids that are um, moving around a lot, they're gonna leave everything and move to a new home or a new shelter with nothing and they'll have to start over. And so it means everything from the ground up, hygiene supplies, school supplies, clothing, all of it. And she had a vision test on last month. Mm -hmm, yep. So, yeah, we have lots of, uh, we work with different partners in the community to, to supply glasses and vision exams. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Darla, you've worked as both of us, you're now part-time, but you work with a lot of the volunteers. What would you say to other people about volunteering and how it makes you feel to be part of a program like this? Oh my like gosh. <laughs> we have some of the neatest people volunteering. Yeah. And you don't do it. I mean, you just, you just walk away feeling better about yourself then you went in and you're doing it for the right reason. You're helping kids and we have some just absolutely awesome volunteers. Mm -hmm. so. Well, thank you both for sharing all this information about. Thank you. There are other opportunities to volunteer as individuals or even businesses making connections with schools and students through the site councils and community partners. When we come back, we'll talk about those opportunities and about Lunch Pals with Bright Futures board members. But first we get a look at their impact in this video by Chris Carnes as we go to break. Schools are about developing community and relationship, and our students need that. And the more people that uh, join us and are a part of that, and give them the connection to adults that love them and that care about them and that, that make the difference for them. Having a site council and so many great partners benefits a school really in lots of ways. I know one of the obvious ways that um, first came to light was the needs of our students, physical needs, are, are just so great that sometimes we don't have the resources ourselves uh, as a school or families are struggling and that's a great way to help support them. Every child needs a champion, right? We actually go in and show them sometimes their only constant in their life. Uh, we show up on party days and we dress uh, for Halloween and whatever it is, they, they really love that. They love to be able to, and they become uh, dependent on it. They, they count on us to do that. One of our favorite things every year is to see what costumes Liberty and Journey Church will come <laughs> for our Halloween parties because they always participate. We try to show the children that the community cares for them. And also, we try to show the teachers and staff that the community is behind them and their efforts in teaching these children. So we had a Grandparents' Day event and uh, had invited grandparents in to be a part of some activities to get to see the kids and be a part of 
what their school day is like. And we had a few kids that didn't have anybody who was able to come in for them. There was one boy in particular who really devastated him. And he was actually hiding under the table, crying. So that was the day that Jefferson's partners had decided to be there. And we had a ton of volunteers from Liberty who came and were substitute grandparents. And uh, when he found out he had somebody there. <laughs> he was so excited. I went there four years ago thinking that I was gonna bless someone. That is not true. I'm the one that's blessed because of all the relationships outside the school, inside the school, and with those kids that now interact with you. That is an incredible, incredible thing. And it only takes 20 minutes a week. Really? I mean, you can't carve out 20 minutes a week to do that. It's amazing. Love it. Welcome back. In this Newsmakers, we're talking about Bright Futures Joplin and its efforts to ensure kids get those basic needs to succeed. Besides food and clothes, that also includes connections. Joining our conversation are Bright Futures Board President Larry Warren and Board Vice President John Boyd. Thank you both for being here. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. Us. John, you were one of those people featured in a video we just saw yes. talking about what it means to be a community partner. So tell us about the Community Partner Program. Well, community partnership is very important to the schools uh, individually. Um, we have what we call site councils. So we have business partners coming in from different um, organizations, whether it be Liberty or, or um, uh, faith-based, whatever it is. Uh, we meet with the school once a month and uh, find out what their needs are and uh, go from there. So a school can have multiple business partners? Absolutely. We, uh, I am a partner with Jefferson Elementary and we have about eight eight business partners. So we we actually tackle the issues that they, they can't solve. So how does a business go about adopting a school? I mean, in sure. what school, how do they choose which school? Usually they try to get close geographically to their, their location. Uh, just makes sense, a little easier to get to and from the school. Uh, and, and short term notice of something that the school may need, they're, they're able to be available. And, and what does it mean? I mean, what are some of the obligations or, you know, what are some, I mean, it's a partnership, but, you know, how often do these businesses come to the school? I, I am there three or four times a week. Wow. And if they actually call and someone says, hey, a little Tommy needs some shoes, I go get the pair of shoes. We have it turned around in about 30 minutes. So we can fulfill a need very quickly. So whether it be clothes, food, whatever it may be, we can fill those very, very short time. So besides having the Bright Future organization as a whole, having the businesses right there, you can ask for something and it, it makes it, the turnarounds faster. Correct. Yes. Okay. You know, when, when it first started, um, that was kind of the thing is to get these needs filled quickly because a child without a pair of shoes needs those shoes now. They don't need them a week from now or whatever, uh, especially in the winter time. Uh, we were seeing kids come into school with flip-flops. I know some kids mm -hmm. think that's kind of cool and they do it as just because. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, some of those kids, that's all they may have. And so in order to fulfill those needs as quickly as possible, that's what we, yeah. the intent was. Yep. So there's a program called Lunch Pals. <clears throat> do the businesses fulfill the role of being Lunch Pals? You, uh, in, <laughs> in some instances, yes, but you don't have to be a business partner to do a lunch pal. I started out as a lunch pal. I've had about six lunch pals since <laughs> I started in 2016. And um, 20 minutes a week uh, can change a child's life. Just paying attention. We don't ever want to underestimate the power of a, li a listening ear because uh, those kids will tell you things that are pretty tough sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is it like for you when you become a lunch pal? Well, I went in, I made the mistake and wanted to be a blessing to someone when I was the one that was blessed. Um, the relationship part, they just need a steady figure in their life that they can count on, that they can talk to without any prejudgment or uh, any ramifications from at home. Uh, they just want to tell their story and they just want to feel secure and loved. It's That's someone it. showing up for them. And, yes. and it might be that their parents are working, that they Correct. can't come to school very right. often. Correct, right, right. yep. 
Yep, so we are, uh, the counselors actually pair us up, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a young man that would growl. That's what he would do wow. uh, when I got him in third grade. He is now an 11th grader and uh, is involved in ROTC, has a friend group. He doesn't need me anymore, which is <laughs> sad <okay>. for me, <laughs> but, but it's good for him. He's made his way. And it accomplished what we want to do. Correct. Kind of give them security so they Correct. can achieve yes. on their own. Yes. Um, have you seen Bright Futures grow and change in oh. your time being part of this organization? Oh, oh absolutely. Uh, especially in some of the programs that we have, and I think Amanda and Darla probably talked about the Snack Pack program. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started, we were around 150, and now we're up to 620. Mm -hmm. uh, the needs are so much different now than what they were. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also getting the word out a little bit better, too, and that's part of why we're seeing a, a bigger influx of, of needs. Yeah. Does that make it harder to meet the needs? I mean, there's growing demand. Absolutely. Yeah. Raising the funds, <clears throat> um, getting the, the donations and everything, because most everything we do either comes from a grant or a donation, uh, and then we get it out in whatever form that it might be, clothing or food or whatever. But also, um, we are starting to have a little bit more trouble getting volunteers. Um, we need those volunteers. It's, it's critical to the program uh, that we have them. And it's not, we're not asking you to spend three days a week, uh, like Chip does, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, if you can come in and spend 20 minutes a week, like he does with one of his lunch pals, it makes a world of difference. Yeah. And so that's what we need is the volunteers yeah. to come in and help. Even with, even if they don't want to uh, maybe interact with the children, that's okay. We have a lot of other opportunities for them to be able Behind to Behind the do. scenes. So Absolutely. So how would you recommend people reach out? I mean, there is some forms <clears throat> you have to do to sign up to be a lunch pal, correct? Correct. They'll have to do a, a, a fingerprint-based background check and a family care safety registry, mm -hmm. which, you know, that should be done anyway. Right. And then um, what they do then is just get a hold of Amanda at brightfutures.org mm -hmm. or brightfuturesjoplin.org yep. uh, and they can sign up that way. All right, lastly, what keeps you motivated? Chip? Mm. You know those, uh, just seeing the, <laughs> oh man, just seeing these kids grow, you know, and not only socially, but um, in their learning uh, curve, uh, just, just hanging out with them, I just love it, love it. Wouldn't do any, anything else. Larry? Just the fact that we get more out of it than they do. <laughs> I, I mean, you really do. When you volunteer, as you, you've done for a long time <laughs> yourself, you know how it is, you, you enjoy it. Um, and it brings, makes you feel good, but it also does something for them. A great yeah. benefit to the community. Thank yeah. you both for being here Thank to tell you. us all about Bright Futures Joplin yeah. and your experiences. Thank you, Lisa. That wraps up this edition of Newsmakers. If you would like more information about the Bright Futures program, check out the website brightfuturesjoplin.org. Thanks to our guest, and thank you for watching.